What's needed in the next generation of Web3 games to bring esports to Web3? All right, welcome, ladies and gentlemen. Um, we have a lovely panel of two amazing gentlemen over here. I'd like to start off the panel by welcoming you to AIBC as well and uh, tell us your story. Who are you in a short description and tell us in three words what your company represents. Right. Um, thank you very much for having us. Uh, I don't know if I can make it three words, but I'll keep it short. So my name is Tony. I run a YouTube channel and my main focus is Metaverse, NFTs and the so-called Play to Earn. Cool. Uh, so my name is Anderson McCutcheon. I am the founder and CEO of Chains.com, which is a multi-product CFI company. In the past, I was the head of player acquisition for Riot Games, the maker of League of Legends and Valorant. I was also the head of digital and mobile for the Stars Group for Poker Start and Full Tilt, as well as 80 Day Poker. I am the former founder of Cynerio and Unicoin, one of the first exchanges in the world. Okay, thank you so much for sharing. Um, so let's start off with the very simple question. The next gen of Web3 games, what does that entitle to you? What does that mean to you? First of all, um, the addition of NFTs is something that's very, very valuable to the gaming industry. I've been a gamer all my life since I can remember I've been playing games. Um, the fact that we can now own the assets inside of the game is the, fundamentally the most important thing. I've spent so much money on buying just accessories inside of games that I can't even use. They just look nice and that's it. Once I'm done with the game, I didn't do anything with it. I can't even uh, sell the account, right? So N NFTs are something that fundamentally changes that and uh, add the absolute big, biggest value, in my opinion. Now, uh, we've been talking also before, the whole play to earn part is not what is going to make it go mainstream. Definitely not. The play turn, as it's done now, it is fundamentally flawed. Every game is a pyramid scheme. Not every game, sorry for those who aren't, but a lot of them are. Um, and yes, the tokenomic part needs to be better. A lot, a lot needs to be um, better in order for it to uh, become mainstream. But NFTs are the absolute biggest part right now, yeah. Now you say that, um for example, the tokenomics of it should be better. Do you think um, that soul-bound tokens are the ideal solution for that? I, I, can't, I can't say what the ideal solution would be. You know, if, if, I, if I knew that, you do know? What do you think? Could you repeat the question? So, um, the, the, um, he says that there's a lot of um, flaws within um, the tokenomics aspect. Um, do you think soul-bound tokens would be actually an ideal solution for this? Um, I don't think there is an ideal solution because any game that is tokenomics first will simply not be able to retain its users. It will be able to acquire users because people are often motivated by specific kind of rewards so they're willing to participate in the game for a certain period of time. But retention is only can either caused by very significant extrinsic rewards like significant pay or intrinsic motivation as it often happens with excellent games so excellent games retain users by creating amazing experiences unique experiences that allow them to kind of experience their inner child and play in a very competitive way to enter a state of flow uh, where they are pushing themselves to the very, very boundaries, and that's kind of what happens when people play StarCraft, League of Legends, Overwatch, or even poker. It allows them to operate kind of as, this, as their best self and compete with others or experience a certain character and project themselves through it. And that's what gets people to play games, and no amount of sophisticated token economics can all ever compensate for poor game design. So, um, how I'm understanding is that you want, uh, you think that a more of a personal aspect, so a more, um, you know, where you can connect as a human being aspect, rather than how the Web 3 and Web 4 is actually turning out to be just simple avatars and taking that away. But what would you see as being that a solution towards that? So, for example, do you want players to be talking more all together, or do you want, for example, um, uh, I don't know, an actor becoming one of the avatars that they also um, 
uh, invest in. And then the actor, for example, holds, um, uh, for example, also a panel. What do you think about that? Both of you, of course. Um, so I'll be happy to follow up kind of how what you mentioned about avatars connects to kind of the intrinsic enjoyable experience. So if you look at players on a grand scale, you'll actually see something that is very special. People tend to play roughly the exact same character again over dozens of games. Like some people just play the warrior and they play a warrior in every single game because they're projecting themselves through the different avatars created by different developers for different worlds. So for instance, let's say if you were to enjoy hosting panels and you're like, and you were to be thrown into a metaverse, a world that allows you to host panels, you're like, oh my God, this is amazing. I'm going to be hosting a panel through this digital avatar. Right? And that's an intrinsically enjoyable experience that you would love coming back to. So end of the day, what Web3 has to start with is kind of internalize the fact that people play games to allow them to live through kind of their best, most enjoyable fantasies and create those experiences for them. Web3 can allow that, but for instance, like virtual expositions that allow you to host uh, panels in metaverse environments, and these are great experiences, and you can spend years becoming the best metaverse host. And it, keep, it basically becomes a hybrid of like a game and a real experience, which are both super enjoyable to you. That's really interesting. Um, so then, for you, I have the question. I became a moderator because I started moderating. A warrior becomes by a choice from the very beginning as well. You know, um, you choose that character so you, from your personality instinct. Now, how can a game or how can we also actually um, use a psychological test or anything like that or how can we know for the best incentive, for the best reward for our users that they can choose their characters? In what way do you think that would be possible? So, for, first of all, the reward shouldn't be financial gain because once financial gain um, gets smaller, once um, the token inevitably falls down, they're going to stop playing the game. So fundamentally, it needs to have good gameplay. It needs to be fun. Now, he was talking about the warrior. Yes, if you play like an MMORPG or any kind of RPG game, you can be a warrior, but a lot of people like sports games. So it's not all about the way of the warrior, you know. Um, but yeah. So initially, uh, how do you think we can actually um, improve also the human connection towards this? You mean socializing inside of the games? Well, socializing is a big part of video games. I, I know myself, since I, I am a gamer, so in 2020 when it was locked down, we were playing so many games. We were playing much more than, um, than before, right? We were playing just all kinds of games. So. And it, it was the only way to socialize at that point, and it really did work. I was, I was talking to my friends, but then again, it, it can never replace real life, obviously. And um, do you think there's a difference between um, the next generation, so Gen Z, and the previous ones? Next generation of what? So the, uh, our next generation, Gen Z, right now, do you think there's a difference upon um, how, you, how they so socialize compared to the... Yeah, absolutely, huge. Yeah, so that's an excellent question. I, uh, I think I'll start kind of with a huge shift that we're seeing in how they use products. And I think that shift also affects the way they perceive relationships. So if we were to look at the onboarding experience for games, in the past, an onboarding experience for a game could easily be a few hours. Like if you were to play SimCity or Civilization or StarCraft, like the first hour or two were just horrible. You're trying to figure out the game. And as game progressed and as people were introduced to things like TikTok and Instagram and Facebook, their attention spans have become shorter and shorter. And nowadays, basically, the onboarding experience has to be amazing and delightful and kind of last at least, at most, two or three minutes. So the attention span that we're experiencing now with gamers uh, is microscopic, like people give like two or three minutes to, uh, to the game and then they uninstall. So that kind of tolerance towards products that we used to have in the past no longer exists. The thing is, the horrible thing is, the same level of tolerance is now applied to people. Uh, people tend to block, ignore, or remove people that they do not enjoy communicating with 
in the online space. Like they just unfriend people, they unfollow people, simply based on like these small decisions, okay, this is causing a negative emotion, I'm gonna unfriend it. Which is obviously hugely different from the way people actually develop meaningful relationships. Meaningful relationships often come from violence, from competition, from disagreement, right? Two people end up, end up arguing for three hours, they go out to dinner, they become friends. Creating also a team, in a way. Exactly, so it's a bond, a friction is a bonding experience. And so I think Gen Z is going to be socializing in a very different manner from kind of the previous generation, simply because there's less tolerance for friction. There's less tolerance for someone who I do not enjoy immediately. And so I think, like, as cynical as it is, the world that we build, the games that we build, if we want to allow people to socialize, we need to start catering to these new tastes where people do not give each other a chance. I mean, that's, that's an amazing answer, by the way, as well, too. Um, so how do you think that we can market this idea towards Gen Z? Um, I, in my, in my you know personal Twitter, you know everything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, I, I wouldn't really in, incentivize this. I, I, I hate it, to be honest. I, I hate that everybody has the attention span of a goldfish. Like, you, you have 15 seconds to appeal to someone. You can, can't even have a whole sentence, like, especially with uh, Gen Z, it is so difficult. Like for me running my channel, so um, a little bit about me, I've been, I've been doing YouTube videos for over 12 years, right? And uh, one of the first things I did, I had a gaming channel and that was mostly, uh, odd, the audience was Gen Z and the attention span is horrible. Now that I've switched to um, doing crypto content, crypto education and well, metaverse and gaming and stuff, um, people just watch for longer periods of time. They're not Jay -Z, uh, Gen Z, obviously. They're a little bit older. So incentivizing this with Gen Z, I had, I had to make my videos in a certain style where it's fast-paced, where um, I'm, I'm changing frames all the time, uh, fast-paced fast, fast music. Um, did, you see that, uh, did you see a view increase through that? Yes. Well, just viewers, but um, the attention span, the, the, the watch time was longer, right? So I had to play the game, but I definitely do not like it. I do not want to um, help them have even shorter at attention span, right? So um, do, you act, do you then think that it's actually the generation's problem or the game's problem? Um, so you have to keep in mind that games and Netflix and TikTok, they are competing for the same thing. They are competing for the person's attention. So if, a, if someone plays two hours per day, Fortnite, League of Legends, whatever, those two hours are actually taken away from TikTok. They are taken away from Netflix. And so games, Netflix, and TikTok, we all compete for the same thing. And I mean, I, again, I work for League of Legends, and so when we look into research around player behavior, we literally saw that we are comparable to 5% of all the time people spend in the bathroom, for instance, right? So we're t literally talking, carving out time from people's schedules to play the game. So we are competing for people's attention. And this is what TikTok does by continuously optimizing its algorithm. This is what Netflix does uh, by producing practically algorithmically generated shows that cater to a specific audience where they can project the amount of hours that people are going to spend consuming it. And so it, you can't really hate the players. You literally have to have, hate the game. Yeah, exactly. And all those games, they have to compete with these ever uh, shortening um, attention spans that are caused by companies that are competing for the players' attention. So um, what, what do you see that players are mostly complaining about when um, uh, they're playing a game, for example? Like, what do you see there is a specific thing that they want more out of it? So I don't know, more incentives, about, more uh, rewards, okay. you know, how can... Talking about Web 2 or Web 3 games? Web 3, web three right. Well, um, for, for uh, talking about Web 2 games, people don't really understand NFTs. And well, that's the main reason. I, I was trying to talk to my audience um, that isn't in, in the crypto space about NFTs and about, um, well, crypto games. They hate it. They hate the idea. But I think they hate it because they don't understand it. Um, for Web 3, you mean, 
let's say like this, in, in order for it to become a little bit more mainstream, right? In, in order for, for Web 2 gamers to come into Web 3, fundamentally the game needs to be fun, right? It needs to be fun and the incentive can't be financial. Like um, the play torn part can't come in and it has its use. In my opinion, there can be tournaments, right? Highly skilled players can earn. Um, players that do something nobody else can do can't earn. But if everybody earns, that is flawed and that won't work, in my opinion. Um, so do you think also that, for example, if you would um, make a character in the game, an NFT, but the character would be used as a stock share, so you do not necessarily only have one owner of the NFT, but you can get a fan basis for the whole entire NFT and it would be also um, create a type of like premium membership and everything if you would create that. Do you see that happening? So, so the, the game would actually then increase by stock in real life as well if more people invest in one NFT of, a, of one character inside the game. To me, it sounds more of an investment opportunity and less as less a gaming mechanism. So, do you see also um, Gen Z because they are quite, quite um, you know, arrogant. Those people sometimes, and they do love their investments. Um, do you see that happening ever? I see it happening in the sense that if we were to look at the Gen Z crowd and say, hey, now you can diversify and deploy 20% of your capital into these fractionalized gaming NFTs, I think you would essentially be competing with cryptocurrencies and stocks and Robinhood by mostly providing another investment opportunity for Gen Z and not necessarily a gaming experience for Gen Z. And I think uh, basically, they are they could be gaming somewhere else, but still investing in these fractionalized NFTs that simply provide another way of deploying capital. Um, so we have uh, three minutes now. So I just wanted to ask: uh, Do you have a question towards him, and do you have a question towards him? Okay. Well, that that's a very interesting dynamic. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so we, we were making this analogy before, before we started the panel about this kid who starts playing the piano, right? Um, and he loves playing the piano, obviously. Uh, at one point, the kid starts getting paid for playing the piano. He gets $10 every time he plays. Um, over time, they lower it to five. He still continues playing. Keep in mind, he loves playing the piano. Uh, at some point down the road, six months to one year, they remove um, the payment and he stops playing, um, even though he loves playing it. So, that's one of the fundamental reasons why in uh, the play to earn won't work. And so I kind of wanted to pick your brain. What do you think about this? Yeah, so th there's a lot of research into that, like specifically the behavioral patterns that maintain intrinsic motivation, right? So uh, what we know about uh, the mechanism is called overjustification. Overjustification is a mechanism that is triggered within children and people that basically they enjoy a certain activity intrinsically and once you provide them with an extrinsic reward their motivation over time decreases so they basically they stop enjoying that activity intrinsically and they start relying on an extrinsic reward uh, to do that activity uh, so let's say if you were to take two absolutely identical games and i think i mentioned it in my question beforehand and you would take two identical games and in one game the person pays $5, and in the other game, the person gets paid 50 cents, right? So you have two identical games where one person is paying for the game, and another, uh, the person is paid for the game. People who are paying for the game will keep playing it, and people who get paid for the game will stop playing it. And this is why a lot of the polling that happens in the ecosystem uh, simply doesn't work because people obviously give the answer that is reverse to what we know about human nature, where people basically are more willing to play something they pay for than uh, play something that they get paid for. That's really, in that's really interesting. I, I wouldn't have expected that actually. The, yeah. the, the, like there's a ton of research uh, into that and this is like uh, when they mentioned AAA games and Blizzard and Riot Games and Kings and other kind of looking 
into that, they, they now understand that the play-to-earn thesis simply doesn't work at scale. Um, so just finishing off, do you have a question towards him? Hey, I'm, I'm, I'm almost Gen Z, so ask a Gen Z question, you know? <laughs> ask a Gen Z question, wow. Um, <laughs> what, what do you see ever becoming a web-free game with 100 million users? That's a very good question. Oh, that is, but I'm going to keep it short. League of Legends, but with NFTs. That's it. That, that's, what, that's, what I would, that's what I would definitely play with my friends, owning the characters. That's it. That's it. No, no play to earn. Same, it's fun, but you got the NFTs, that's it. But that, that means that you will be able to somehow reutilize those NFTs as elsewhere. Sell, sell them down the road on the market, perhaps. Maybe you play very well at a tournament and your NFT goes up in value because you use that one to win the tournament. Make pentacles, something like that, you know? That's what I have in mind. That's what I would use. You know, I, I'm just looking at myself here. What I personally would very much enjoy playing and what I could play for months down the road. It's something like that, you know? No play to earn. What are your thoughts on his answer? Um, Do you agree or disagree? <laughs> there is no clear binary answer to that. I think anyone who gives you like a binary answer just doesn't understand the full complexity of like game economics within something like League of Legends that caters to 150 million people that have different motivations when it comes to the game. We literally, we've mapped up different motivations for why people play the way they play. Because some are competitors, some are explorers, some uh, enjoy the social aspect, some literally play at the highest level, but they, they, they feel comfortable being capped. So uh, to me, like when we introduce something like that, I'm thinking about what sort of player would find this um, enjoyable enough to increase their play retention within the game, to get them to play more within the game. Uh, I just don't have the data, so, so I don't have strong thoughts about it. Remain, remain to be seen, for sure. And gentlemen, if you have any questions towards players in games and Web3, these are the two men that are the men of the hour. Okay, so go ahead and talk to them. And thank you so much for your time. Thank you for having us. Thank you. <laughs>